Hello, everyone, and welcome to Via Monster Academy Office Hours. It is Wednesday. It is 4.30 p.m. outside of Chicago, or most of the Chicago area, to be perfectly honest with you. And uh, this is where you can ask questions about the MDT, Config Manager, Intune, Azure, PowerShell, and pretty much everything around that area. So shall we uh, get the show on the road? Show on the road, Andrew? Let's do it. All right. All right. Here we are. What a six, seven days long week this has been. Yes, it has. Uh, What a strong finish to our. Intune Masterclass last week, and then uh, some of us had a long weekend. Uh, Very long weekend. <clears throat> and, we'll, we'll, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was not the most relaxing last few days or last week, put it that way. No. But we do, as usual, have some good news as well. Andrew, you have been sca- uh, or scavenging the, the uh, internet for information (laughs) absolutely well first and foremost as i pull my notes up here you're obviously dressed for the occasion since we found out season three of the mandalorian is coming out march 1st let's get that out of the way yeah very important (laughs) um but if you want to share my screen um i do have some actual relevant it news (laughs) um so we got some news. The yeah, right. It's IT. It's uh, it in the computer. It, it, yeah, exactly. That class qualifies it then, I think, for sure. Um, I forgot to mention this last week, but we had some good news on um, improvements to the Win32 app supersedents um, that are expected Q1 of this year. So it's, it seems to me that the improvements are uh, especially surrounding um, supersedence interaction with app dependency and the enrollment status page with autopilot. So there's some changes to dependency processing, uh, the detection checks, app tracking, um, and that sort of thing. So important post to be aware of if you're using supersedence, dependency, and installing apps during the uh, enrollment status page during autopilot. Um, <clears throat> so good stuff there. We're always happy to see this service improve, I think. Um One of our friends over at the MS Endpoint Manager team, Nikolai Anderson, uh, seems to have been a very busy man the last couple of days. Uh, I caught this tweet from him earlier this morning. He put together a script that will help you more easily manage um, scope tags for your Intune configuration profiles. Uh, So this is posted on the MS Endpoint Manager GitHub repo. And basically, this allows for adding, removing, replacing scope tags across a variety of different configuration profiles, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. And this included the endpoint security profiles as well. And Nikolai also released an update to his config manager prereq tool. So if you haven't used this before, though I've got a feeling uh, if you've used Config Manager, you likely have run across this tool at some point or another. This makes um, configuring a new Config Manager site uh, quite a bit easier by downloading and configuring some of the prereqs required for installing a site server or a DP um, or some of the other site roles. And this update... uh, just added support for basically uh, better support for the newer releases of the ADK. Um, so important update there. Uh, and then Damien as well. I feel like he's gotten a shout out every week here for the last few weeks. Uh, again, busy contributing to the community. Um, wrote up a, a nice blog post about reporting and controlling your Dell BIOS versions um, with log analytics. Um So this is using a proactive remediation script and does not have any other uh, 
uh, prereqs. Um, so he calls out, for example, executables, any Azure automation, any Azure blob storage, that sort of thing. Um, so pretty cool, lightweight solution, it looks like. Um, yeah, but and- sometimes uh, simple goes a long way. Uh, it doesn't have to be that complicated to get the job done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that's what it looks like this solution does. Um, so if this is something you need in your environment, definitely I would recommend taking a look at this. Uh, and thank you, Damien, for churning out the blog posts lately. We appreciate it. And I'm sure the community does as well. Um, so that was all I had for now. I think you've got a few important updates that you found as well. Yeah, I figured we could start with... Uh, uh Last Friday morning, that didn't turn out so great for for uh, many folks. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, we were presenting a course or a class last week, a master class, that suddenly got a notification from people. I'm sorry, I need to leave. I need to leave. I need to leave right now. I'll be back later. Something is going on. And sure enough, uh, shortcuts were disappearing left and right for organizations that I was using the attack surface rules. Um, uh, the, uh, security solution basically or security feature and that went on the entire Friday and over the weekend and I know a lot of organizations were basically having a hard time trying to figure things out uh, the community started to provide uh, several scripts to restore these shortcuts that were deleted and eventually uh, Friday afternoon at some point Microsoft released the first version of the script and they continued to improve that over the weekend by, for example, uh, I can bring that one up. Uh, I think it's a good, when I can find my screen, I will do it. How about that? There are so many buttons. <laughs> yes, so many buttons, so many tabs, so many windows. All right, let's see if I close yours and add mine. There we go. Magic, yeah, here we go. Uh, this is not it. Uh, that's a config manager server. But uh, Microsoft released uh, the script. Uh, there is a shortcut uh, for it on ak.ms. Um, so AS for, uh, ASRFB recovery. Uh, so that particular script helps you uh, restore those shortcuts. And if you go to that script on GitHub, you will see that I actually made some uh, interesting changes over the last two days. So if you go to the history here and you start to compare the earlier versions with the more recent versions, uh, you will find that, uh, for example, if you search for volume shadow copy here, uh, they started that in the ability to get use those as a sort of a source for the restore. I haven't had a chance to try the latest version here, but I thought it was interesting that they are continuing to improve and help try to get this going, obviously. It was a royal pain for a lot of folks uh, last week and uh, a royal mistake, of course, on who is ever managing those updates. But sometimes bad things happen and we have to deal with it. That's usually why we got hired in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> so um, not ideal, but here we are. Uh, I do have some good news also, actually. Uh, it happens. Uh, Jürgen has been very creative. Jürgen Nilsson, one of our instructors, he has been uh, posting a little uh, blog post on uh, how to configure the new app installer, somewhat new app installer, meaning uh, when you get the Windows Package Manager. So uh, we make sure to share that link in the chat with you guys or in the, uh, in the link uh, section for this office hours. I was also happy to find out that our good friends over at uh, Workplace Ninja are going to the land down under Australia. That's exciting. Yeah, they are holding their first event on March 17. Uh, if you are in that part of the world, highly recommend trying to join and definitely sign up for their meetup link and make sure to participate in that community. They have been going strong in, in Europe for many, many years, and it's nice to see them uh, expanding. Pretty cool. So congratulations on that. To that team. 
Uh, Esvar has been busy as well, a uh, long time uh, Config Manager MVP or champion in the Config Manager community as well, for that matter. He put together a nice blog post on different ways of identifying co managed devices. Everything from using it in Intune to using it in Config Manager and and reporting and whatnot. So I thought it was a good, good little article to to know about. And finally, um, let me show you this. So this is one of my uh, Config Manager Lab environment. Uh, this one is not terribly updated, but it's not too terribly far behind either. If your environment doesn't say this, but say this instead, I just wanted to give you a heads up, but that particular version goes out of support in two weeks. So February 2nd is the end of life for Config Manager 2107. And I have the official link here and again we will as usual share these links uh, afterwards so uh, time to upgrade if you are on this release and obviously if you are still behind on anything older it might be a wise decision to upgrade as well yeah i mean it looks like even 2111 will be uh, out of support in june and 2203 in october so yeah it's uh it's not too long these days, but luckily it's mm -hmm. easy to upgrade. There are plenty of guidance around to, to do it. And uh, it usually doesn't take too many hours to upgrade a site. And the downtime is not terrible either. You should talk about one, two hours at most, depending on your size a little bit. But mm -hmm. it's often a very seamless process. And most organizations, they won't even notice. They're like, what do you mean? If it's been down, it's been working perfectly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, some, some heads up there. And that was the last news that I had on my list. Uh, uh, <laughs> you see, we once again get away from the cloud management community. Thank you so much for that one. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling it might be Dean Ellerby that is behind that one, but not sure if it's just one person or actually multiple team, multiple folks. It's a good question. Yeah. If only it was a way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Uh, anyhow. Uh, There's your answer. Me. Yeah, the main lady. <laughs> good to have you back. Yes, thank you. All right. So, the folks out there, any questions? Any questions at all? We're happy to try to answer. Mm -hmm. See if we can get stumped today. Yep. Hello, back to Matt. Good to have you back mm -hmm. as well. Familiar name in the office hours community or the, the office hours um, office hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there are no questions, we will be forced to start to uh, basically uh, dissect the latest trailer. It's going to take a while. <laughs> That's fine by me. <laughs> I can think of worse ways to spend the next 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right. There was a question coming in from Matt regarding uh, Cisco client or rather the installation of the, the umbrella component for uh, the Cisco VPN system. Um, the common error is that you get a 1603 error from the MSI installer when trying to uh, either upgrade or reinstall the same version on of that particular client. And um, I have seen that question before and, and did a bit of research on it, but I don't. I cannot say I have a super solid solution for it. Um, it seems to be like removing the driver or manually uninstalling the driver with some of the native components is a way to go. But if you Google that particular question, you will end up with tons of different uh, 
answers or, or solutions. So I don't have anything I tested, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm not a Cisco Any Connect guru in any way. Where is a Richard when you need one? <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, the, this, this particular search here, if you do a Cisco, oops, I cannot type today either, it seems, about Umbrella, uh, MSI error 16 or 3, uh, there will be uh, tons of different uh, comments around this. A lot of people facing the same structure or same issues. So uh, I would have to do some more research to be able to, to give you a better answer. But um, uh, basically start to start reading through all of these uh, different solutions and even scrolling down a few pages uh, down in the search result uh, sometimes give you a, a clue. But yeah, that, that's unfortunate. Unless you, Andrew, have some brilliant uh, insight on this. Unfortunately, I do not, uh, <laughs> especially not on the umbrella side. I mean, I've done so many Connect installs, but not run into this particular issue um, and not had to, to use any of the integrations with umbrella. Yeah. Uh, something that, that I, I um, would recommend, though, is, uh, of course, our uh, friends over at uh, Patch My PC. Mm -hmm. See if I have their publisher here, maybe. Um, thought I installed it here. Yeah, here it is. I know I had it somewhere. Uh, if I go to either the Config Manager apps or the Intune apps, depending on what you're using it for or, or both, uh, there is indeed installers for uh, the various Cisco components, uh, including Umbrella, I think I saw somewhere. Uh, but uh, yeah, down here. And what, what they often have in, in their setup is their packaging team often spends a ridiculous amount of time testing these packages. So sometimes you can find uh, settings here that can help uh, doing uh, like updates or reinstallations and, and, and whatnot. Uh, maybe add pre or post scripts to it to, to deal with things. But yeah, that, that's all I can think of at the moment that, that can help a, a Cisco uh, setup. Uh, I would actually have to start to actually dive into it and see what's going on to to have more insight, I think. Great question, though. Mm -hmm. so if anyone happens to know, everyone happened to stumble across this particular issue, uh, please reach out. we will be happy to share that information further. Any other questions? Great questions. We still have a whooping 31 <clears throat> minutes available. No, 41 minutes available. Yeah. Math. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, like you said, it's been a long week. <laughs> um, Matt had another question. Uh, someone on his team is facing an error to connect to SCCM even when I type the site name with the FQDN. Um, uh, like. like the console, I, I guessing. Yeah, and if it is the console, I've seen a couple of different things there. I've seen if the if the FQDN changes, having the old one stuck. Uh, yeah, D uh, Dean, it's never DNS. <laughs> Could be DNS, firewall, uh, all three of those things I've seen um, be an issue before. Um, yeah, I mean, there are certain ports that needs to be open for, let's see, uh, SCCM firewall ports. They have a generic page with all the ports that needs to is used for different stuff. Let's see if the console is there somehow, somewhere. Um, yeah, basically making sure that these consoles are Available, these are outbound. Let's see if we see any more good stuff here. Is that it? 
That looks like it from that point of view. Surprised to not see any incoming ports. Was it that console to the SMS provider? Could have been. Could have been. I wonder if there is more available on this one. Oh. No, nothing here. But basically trying to find the, the ports that the console is using and making sure they are open so it can talk to the provider. Yeah, Dean said in the chat, um, or cloud management community said in the chat, uh, that uh, he thinks it's 135, which I believe was uh, was what it listed in that um, document that you had up. All right, perfect. Excellent. So hopefully that will help. Let's see what else. Um, Matt did have a follow-up. Uh, it's only for one user. All have access except this one person. What log do I have to check? Um, well, the admin UI log might show some information about that, uh, which is under... Should go in the installation folder for the console. Yep. Why can't I find it on this one? I'm assuming it can also be permissions, but in, in general, that that shows later. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anyways, the admin UI log in the console install folder um, should give you. Hopefully, some more details. All right. Let's see what else. <clears throat> uh, we have a question from Damon on LinkedIn, uh, and a suggestion from troubleshooting reporting from the console from any workstations outside the DP server. I'm not entirely following the question, and or if it's accessing the report. I think I might need a little bit of clarification on that one. Yeah, any if if it is about just accessing the reports, then for me, again, it's always been either firewall or permissions. I mean, there's a service account being used as well, typically for reporting. And that account needs to have the right password when you set up the role. And unfortunately, when, when you do that configuration in, in Config Manager, uh, there is no validate option in, in, the, in the wizard when you add that role in like they have in many other places. But you usually get a, a message, if that's the case, when you try to open a report, it will actually back, basically say access denied, and uh, you can, can con, uh, go back and reset that password for the service account used for reporting services. Um, mm -hmm. Also, if you cannot run them from the console, uh, for whatever reason, you can try to go directly to the website, because um, it is SQL reporting services. Um, that that yeah. would be my. And if it is, okay. uh, Damon followed up that it was fine on the server. So uh, I would just add, in addition to the console firewall ports that we were just looking at, Johan, uh, you need to have, if it's just on HTTP, you obviously have to have 80 open from wherever you're accessing it to the reporting services point. Um, and 443 for HTTPS. 
Yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen like th third party uh, antivirus or firewall software getting in the way, blocking yeah. those links. It uh, can be proxies, um, C scalar type configurations, something that prevents the clients from accessing it or just core blocks, uh, SSL inspection, something. Surely you've never had problems with proxies before. <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> more than I would like. That seems like a common common uh, issue. Yep. Um, also, I had a, a question from uh, cloud management community. Uh, what are your favorite new features in Config Manager? Do you have any? Have been any? I haven't honestly not paying attention too much lately. Um, that I remember on the top of my head. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, if I bring up the list. Uh, uh, can probably come up with a few. That's not the latest. That is is the latest. Um, well, <laughs> I like this one. I was mm -hmm. actually explaining this in, in a class earlier today that it's not the best idea to continue to use the network access account. And at least now the, the console will give you a fair warning if you still do, because um, that particular account is usually accessible not only during imaging, but also after a machine is being imaged. And the recommendation is to not use it and rather use uh, either a pure uh, uh, PKI, like um, a full HTTPS implementation, or at the very least uh, in the communication security tab, uh, to use enhanced HTTP because HTTP only is no longer supported. It was deprecated last year at some point, November, December, whatever it was. So you should have either this or this today. And if you do, you don't have to use the network access account any longer. And not for imaging, at least. There are some exceptions. There are certain features that is not available anymore, but those features you're not supposed to use anyway. Not going to mention any names, but multicast, stay away from it. If you want performance, use peer to peer. Works fine without the network access account. So that is a nice warning. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this, this, this goes back way back in the days where Roger Sander and, and Kim Opalfans first presented. Um, uh, this particular session at MMS uh, gives you a little bit of background info to all of this. And also what you can do if you actually must have it. Um, there are certain uh, ways that at least you can lock it down. And, and Kim wrote a, a um, um, a multiple series guide on, on how to secure that account that I really liked. So you can see I visited that many times. But this one here, to lock it down further than what Microsoft has in their base recommendation, it will still function. So if someone is able to get access to the username and password, they still won't be able to do much with the account. But I mean, the, uh, the obvious solution is to stop using it. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, this one I liked, being able to do that through PowerShell, speed up uh, migrations of content. Mm -hmm. um, I guess featured app is nice, but have I used it yet? No, have not. 
2203 actually had a pretty long list as well. Uh, that was when they added Leadbat support for software update points and um, nice. yeah. uh, escrowing the BitLocker recovery key during a sequence to the Config Manager database. I know that a lot of people were happy about that feature. Yeah, the original or the first BitLocker management implementation from an OSD point of view laved out room for <laughs> growth. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm happy they fixed that. That was actually a, a painful month. So basically um, you had to sit around and wait, right, for it to actually escrow everything back? Yeah, but it was not only that. If you accidentally had your old sequence with your old MBAM, you know, script that you would run, it mm -hmm. would make Config Man you're a little bit upset. And mm -hmm. I fixed that fairly quickly, though. Uh, but I'm really happy to see the native support for it uh, in Config Maddie. Very nice. Well, and of course, how could we forget dark, dark mode? A, a long standing request. Yep, that, that is true. Uh, I haven't really. Um, embrace that fully uh, except for one reason or one platform I refuse to <laughs> launch <laughs> VS Code in anything but this mode. I know there are others and eyes you can look at look like eyes I don't want it to look like eyes <laughs> yeah. so that, that's my exception uh, I might change over time I agree. That and my phone. Usually I let my phone switch into dark mode as well at night, especially. Makes sense. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, good point there from the cloud management community. If you're recording videos and you have glasses, there is a very big difference compared to have a bunch of white screens versus a dark mode variant in terms of reflections. You have stumped across that also, Andrew? I have. These uh, new glasses I got just a week ago or so, I, I had to get the anti-glare in them just because there's so much light and, and brightness sitting around me. So, yes, I understand. Maybe I'll just have to make the switch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a solution also. It might be cheap with them. Glasses. Yes. Yes, I think so. All right, there was a question coming in on using service UI uh, XE to prompt Windows to add a device name. So service UI.exe is an executable that came with the MDT integration that work around the limitation in the sequence to prompt for info while in full Windows. However, most deployments when you need to type in a computer name, it's bare metal deployment when you are in WinP, and then there is absolutely no need for service UI, because at that point, you can interact as much as you want uh, prior to the sequence kicks in. So you can have a little DB script or PowerShell script or HTA or application, whatever, that simply asks for a computer name. If you have to do it in, in full Windows when the sequence is running, by all means, you can use serviceui.exe. Uh, I also use that a lot for troubleshooting, uh, troubleshooting application installs, troubleshooting scripts, when I can run them over and over again to see what happens. But uh, there is nothing prevents you from kicking it in earlier. And for example, the um, uh, we talked about the new release of PowerShell app deployment kit uh, last week. Uh, that one is still... Uh, using serviceui.exe in some capacity or can use it. Uh, the UDI wizard and MDT integration does use it still. Uh, so it is useful. Uh, I wrote a blog post back in whatever that was. Um, it was not yesterday. Um, It was in 2012, so that was 11 years ago. But how you can 
use it to start a command prompt for troubleshooting, for example, or a PowerShell prompt for troubleshooting. Um, but yeah, I've seen examples of using this also to start, not just the UDI wizard, but other uh, front ends. Uh, it's doable. But for imaging, you typically don't have to do it uh, using this. You can just have the boot image started early. And what I often see is organizations, if they do have a front end, like um, say something like this. Uh, was showing this in a demo earlier today, but um, uh, uh, where you start a deployment and, and you show something to select the role or type in the computer name or select the sequence or whatever that may be, um, you usually start them as early as possible. So that usually means that you either do it in the pre-start function in config manager meaning the tsconfig INI file, or even earlier through an unattended XML file. Uh, so it depends a little bit on what the solution does. Uh, the beautiful thing in Config Manager to use the uh, pre-start option, uh, the one that you set here on your boot images in customizations, uh, this one here, is that the sequence environment is loaded at that point. So if you need to update variables, like OSD computer name or whatever variable you need to update, it is now available to you. If you started earlier through an attend XML, you don't have it because the environment is not yet started. So tsconfig is uh, king there. Stuff. Great question. <clears throat> uh, I had another question in here that I think you might be able to take, Johan. Uh, how would you guys go about updating device BIOS in an OSD task sequence, and would you recommend updating BIOS this way? Oh, heck yes, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite things. I'm happy that you <laughs> asked whoever it was. <laughs> no, uh, most of... Uh, People who knows me uh, know that I like doing BIOS updates as part of an imaging process or as an update mechanism when the machine has been deployed. And those who really, really know me, they know that I actually absolutely love doing it that way. So there is a difference. But um, I'm the biggest fan of the modern driver management solution. We use it for a lot of different customers. we are using it for years where you're using the driver automation tools that Maurice Daly and, and Nikolai has been involved in. Uh, Maurice primarily the UI and Nikolai primarily the, the installer script, but they are both working together with this for, for years. But this one allows you to do driver packages, bias packages, or both. So you basically select the models that you want and you hit download and import and uh, you go back to your console and you will have a bunch of packages. In this case, a bunch of Dell updates or Dell BIOS updates. And to get them deployed, you just add a few scripts to your sequences. So if I go back to this server here, here is one of the sequences I've been using. But it's just a, 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 not that one. Uh, this one, uh, a very small sequence that um, sets the service account to use. And that particular account needs to have at least read-only permissions in Config Manager. So in my uh, users that I have on my site server here, I do have an admin user here that I have given read-only analyst. And that is the account that I'm using here in the sequence. And then I have the native script that comes with the solution that downloads the right package. And it will only download the package if the BIOS version is uh, newer, available on the server. And uh, then, of course, each vendor has their own install script. So depending on how many vendors you work with, 
you're going to need one, two, three, or four different scripts. But I just have a condition on these scripts so it will only run if the vendor is HP in this case. Um, a cool update to these solutions in the last year and a half, two years, is they switched from using a custom web service to use the, the native admin service in Config Manager. And when you have that service, um, let's see if I have the test script somewhere. I was playing around with them earlier. Yeah, this one here. Um, just going to ask for credentials. I'm going to use them in a bit. Um, uh, I need to run this one. So you can start to ask the admin service for information. Uh, just uh, some generic metadata, or in this case, hey, give me all driver packages. You can do the same thing for BIOS packages. And, and then you can start to test various um, uh, actions in those different scripts that Maurice and Nikolai provides. So you can actually do like a, a, a fake deployment of something. Uh, and then you can review the log file and see like, okay, what if I would try to deploy that device? Would there be a match? Yeah, there will be a match because there is a package that is matching this. So very, very useful to work with, I think. And this sequence that I showed, uh, the BIOS update one, I can boot the machine on that one. Wrong server. Dang it. Uh, <clears throat> Too many windows. Not enough site servers. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> barely, barely 20, cannot have. Anyhow, uh, uh, this one I can deploy a machine with or start a machine up and just do a BIOS update if I want. I can push it out to existing machines or I can link it to one of my other sequences. So if I go here and go to one of my MDM sequences, I think this one has it. No, that was drivers only. See this little friend. Yeah, this one has both. So this one contains both modern driver management and modern bias management. In this case, I was only updating my Dell machines. I only had Dell, but I could have copied that script or section in here, the entire folder, or I could have removed this and instead uh, just linked in that child sequence that contained the, uh, the BIOS update configuration. And that way I can have multiple sequences sharing this. So a few different options available. But yes, I, I love this way of having a generic option or way of updating all vendors. Um, because a lot of customers I work with, they, they work with multiple vendors. Um, they may have a main one, but they have often other uh, as well. And I don't usually like having to switch completely different methods just because I work with a different different vendor. That's my take so, on it. So is that why you like having that child um, sequence as well? Just the flexibility of being able to use it standalone, use it within another sequence, if you've got to make any changes to it, you just do it there and you don't have to pick through all of your other sequences. Yeah, it's, it's a simpler setup. So I usually yep. uh, keep around a bunch of, like I call them Lego blocks. That, that's how I refer to them. But I use them in many different sequences. It's just blocks that does, you know, something. Oh, you're speaking my language. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Very cool. That's a good, great question. Yep. All right. Well, we've had a few more uh, roll in and we've got 15 minutes left. <clears throat> All right, let's go. So let's see. We did service UI. Um, I had a question come in from Damon on, on LinkedIn. How do I reduce the amount of encryption CM does to any one workstation? Too many keys. 
Might need a little clarification on that one myself. I don't quite follow. At first, I thought it was the encryption level, like which algorithm to pick. Or it's a number of escrows. Well, Damon, if you're still on, if you could provide a little clarification, please. We'll try to tackle that one. Um, Robert's asking on YouTube, any positive or negative perspective regarding using pull DPs? No, they can be quite useful in and depending on how your network looks. Um, a classic example for a pull DP would be, let's see, um, uh, you have two sites. Uh, you have uh, an old DP uh, over here, and you want to spin up a new one. So say that you have a, a 10 megabit link in between your site server. So this is your site server over here. I usually call them SEMA1, but you know, site server. Uh, and if you spin up a second one, because the old one is a 2012 R2 server and you realize maybe that should go away and maybe you don't like to do in-place upgrades, I don't, then I can set up this second one as a pull DP to get content from the first one. And when I'm done, I scratch that one and promote this one to be a normal DP. And I've just saved transferring a 600 gig content library over a 10 megabit one link. Um, also very useful depending on how your network is laid out. Say that you have um, are in multiple countries, so you may have uh, a lot of different sites that are not well connected to the site server, but they are somewhat well connected to each other. Uh, I was trying to keep that green. I usually brag about my paint skills, but this is <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, so imagine that you have multiple sites like this. I will start to spin up uh, DPs in, in, in other sites that are big sites, and they are well connected to the first one. Well, these two down here, I think, makes perfect sense to be pull DPs to pull content from that one, instead of all three having to have content from the site server. Now, in all fairness, I spend pretty much every week of my working life to help organizations get rid of distribution points. So I would rather say, hey, use that peer-to-peer -peer instead if you can, because it's simpler to manage than having to deal with lots and lots of DPs. But sure enough, there are scenarios where DPs are absolutely valid to use. Uh, you're gonna need at least one, how, <laughs> no matter what you do. And depending on your size, you, you are gonna need more than one. But you don't need to have 700 or 150. You may need 11. That's it. So my take on it. Good stuff. <clears throat> Very good stuff. I got to show off some paint skills too. That's not bad. I never get grow tired of seeing your paint skills. <laughs> um, cloud management community on YouTube asking any views on the updated uh, PSADT. So presuming that's the one that was released a couple of weeks ago. I have not had the opportunity to play with the new release yet. Have you, Johan? I have not. I just saw the uh, started to watch. I didn't have the time to finish that one either, but I will. Uh, Matthias Melikerson did an interview with the founders, and I talked about it a little bit, but I haven't tried it out. I know it's an extensive change log. <laughs> Took yeah. a minute to read through it. Yeah. So no, um, sorry, have not. Um. Matt's asking on YouTube, what is the best way to pick the name for Windows devices in autopilot instead of picking auto names? Uh, 
by default there there is none. Uh, Autopilot doesn't have a built-in like prompt for name type thing, but with a little bit of creative scripting, it's not too hard to achieve. Um, we have been using uh, the native PowerShell module that comes from Autopilot uh, together with the web service to ask for a computer name early in the process and then simply set that computer name to the device as part of the staging process in Autopilot because there is an option to do so. Uh, when an update is, or uh, when a device is added as a device in Autopilot, there is an option to actually set the name on the device. So you can use any naming standard that you have for that, as long as you script in the name during the autopilot process. But in terms of autopilot itself, uh, it has just a very generic uh, naming template that you can apply in the profile. Uh, but if you don't find a bit of scripting, pretty much anything can be done in terms of names. Good question. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Robert asking um, sort of a follow-up question or related question to updating BIOS. Uh, how do you convince your paranoid manager that it is not a risk using OSD to update a BIOS? Uh, I mean, I didn't. I would rather say, what about if you don't? There are CVEs every other week, it seems, that are related to biosecurity. Mm -hmm. Whether you rather like to get ransomware or you rather risk doing an upgrade of, of the bias. Uh, here in the US lately, there has been a mandate for a lot of uh, infrastructure organizations to do bias updates and TPM updates uh, more frequently or else. Basically, they get a, a hefty fee if they don't. And BIOS updates are getting better. Uh, if someone had asked me 10, 15 years ago if they should update a BIOS or driver just because there was a new version available, it's been like, no, 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 please, because <laughs> it was more likely that they would actually break something than fix something. But these days, the process of testing is much better. Uh, it's quite rare that I see BIOS updates breaking devices. Uh, it's been a while since I saw it, actually. Same. So I, I would say that the risk, the security risk is, is way more critical to deal with than the risk of having a device going bad on you. Uh, and Microsoft uh, understands this as well. That's why they've been working so hard on the upcoming deployment service uh, they're supposed to be released in public preview now in March. We'll still will see if that happens, but they understand the need of, of having updates for these uh, and will have a generic way to do it for all vendors through that deployment service uh, into co-managed devices. And that's why I think you'll see too, there's a need for, you know, uh, Damien's reporting that we mentioned earlier on Dell BIOS versions or MS Endpoint Manager's solutions on uh, reporting that type of information. If if yeah. you're if you're needing to gather that information, then the reason I would say typically is because you're going to likely need to update and manage BIOS. Yeah, I mean we we have covered some of these features in in earlier um, office hours, but. Uh, if I go, say, to the security site, if you have a Defender for Endpoint, um, uh, these days, um, if you go to the recommendations around basically risks and, and start to peek around in inventory, uh, it will tell you now whether you have a risky business, but firmware that are uh, actually have some sort of weakness in them. Uh, typically means they have a CVE attached to it and uh, you should upgrade those devices. So maybe show this in the face of your manager and say, hey, you what, this, this is official uh, security information from Microsoft in this case, but basically they're saying that we have a security risk on our biases, we should upgrade. Um, 
it goes hand in hand with security patching. I, I don't think there is any manager, uh, I hope there is no manager today that says no to patching because that would be a bad decision. Um, so they shouldn't say no to patching or biases either. Agreed. Uh, I'm going to drop a, a link to um, the announcement for this specific feature as well, Johan. So if anybody wants to review it, uh, that'll be in the links for today. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, <laughs> cloud management community, when you were looking at sequences earlier, uh, noticed a sequence that had 21H2 in the name created in 2017. Is that accurate? The sequence was created in 2017. That is accurate, but I have changed the image many times since. <laughs> <laughs> Probably been modified a hundred times since then. Yep. Uh, I actually keep, uh, 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 I have a, an event handler that um, Mike Costa wrote probably a decade ago, but I use it for, for backup of my sequences. So every time I do a change in a sequence, uh, there will be a copy created here, uh, and there'll be every version of every sequence so I can restore it if I do something stupid. That's awesome. Which may or may not have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine. Yeah. So, no, I have this lab has been around for a while. I can tell you that. Very cool. All right, uh, John's asking on YouTube, Did you uh, do you still have to re-edit each task sequence after you make changes to a child TS? In the past, I had to re-link the child TS to each parent TS before. Uh, less likely these days, but you still may have to do it. Okay. So when you make a change, make sure you test. That's a good solution also, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good deal. Um, did you get a chance to review chat GPT uh, to generate a script to see how accurate? Matt was asking that on YouTube. I, I did a, a few tests just when uh, it basically got the big announcement and everybody started to use it. And yeah. it did produce a script that was fully functional. Uh, so I have a feeling that the future is going to be a little bit scary. And I have a feeling that, that we will have to start to embrace the use of uh, AI to speed up what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any time in the near future that will be able to replace us. But I have a feeling that uh, an engineer that is good in uh, using AI together with development of scripts might be able to churn out scripts quicker than one that doesn't. That's my view on it. I completely agree. I mean, in my experience, the few things that I've asked from it, uh, I didn't have something that was a hundred percent there. Um, you know, maybe maybe it was eighty percent of the way, but it was a phenomenal start for a script that I didn't have uh, in the first place. And then I was able to just by you know being familiar with the service and the scripts that I was running or needed to run was able to fill in that other 20%. But uh, I think that just goes to your point, Johan. Uh, the, the, you, you can use it to, or will be able to use it to fill in some gaps or save some time, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, think of uh, OpenAI, Copilot, and the others. It's like, they are fairly fresh. Yeah. Give them 10 years and yeah. a few billion dollars. That will be... Interesting, I think. I would say so. So uh, we're at 5.30, but we've got one more question that I think uh, you might want to take. Uh, is So this is okay. coming in on YouTube. Is there any chance to learn Intune management at home? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's a shameless plug, obviously, but. The academy we do offer trainings everything from free mini courses to paid versions and that is uh, a great way of, of learning um, into being able to ask questions live and whatnot so highly recommended but it's of course 
that would be up to you. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> yes, I, I love that question. <laughs> All right. We are uh, over and out for today. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much, everyone, for asking questions and joining us. It's been a blast, and we'll see you next Wednesday, hopefully. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Bye for now.